Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased that you took the time to attend this uh, encounter. As uh, a reminder, this is uh, part of a whole series of encounters. Encounters are uh, at the shores of translation. We are very pleased today and now to uh, welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Najet Mshela. Professor Najet Mshela is a professor of literature and also translation. She obtained a maîtrise de lettres anglaise in 1977 and from the uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Tunis, English and American Literature and Civilization with Linguistics, Sociolinguistics and Applied Linguistics, and certainly uh, translation. She also obtained a DOR in 1979 in Anglophone Studies. Uh, in 83 a doctorate in a doctora in anglophone studies and she had the habilitation to the position of maître de conférence in 2004 and habilitation to the position of full professor in 2008 she is also a, uh, she uh, has so many areas of self taught areas Maghrebin history, culture, and literatures, anthropology, linguistics, modern philosophy, and sociology, postmodernist thought, and so on and so forth. And this shows how multidisciplinary our guest is. She has also extensive professional uh, experience uh, and she carried out so many activities. Um, she uh, has teaching responsibilities. She was teacher of French and Tunisian Arabic for Peace Corps volunteers in summer to 1975 and 1976. And she has uh, resp she had responsibilities at the Institut Bourguet de Langue Vivante and other uh, institutions. Uh, I can see now the CV is really uh, rich with activities. Uh, she's, she was matter assistant and then professor uh, from uh, 1990 to till 2004, teaching literature and literary theory, British American, American uh, African American and African literature, poetry, novel, drama, comparative literature, fact, uh, fiction and film, world cinema, women's studies, colonial and post-colonial literatures, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, especially uh, for us, uh, the uh, translation part, and she has uh, published very extensively as well, and I can provide you with a list of her publications. For translation, she uh, um, was also she has been very active in translation, and she is a conference interpreter as well. She will be speaking today about intercultural communication across languages uh, in time and space, and I think these are very important elements for novice translators for students uh, and also to understand the act or the exercise of translating in general uh, because it is not a strictly linguistic activity because what we are translating uh, goes beyond uh, the transfer of something from one language to another but the translator and or the interpreter, they have to have that competence of uh, intercultural uh, communication. And they have to be very sensitive to issues related to context, space, time, and so on and so forth. In addition to, and I uh, requested our guest speaker, Professor Mshela, to speak about 
the 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 global and the local because uh, the uh, translator and the interpreter is taking uh, uh, journeys uh, from the global to the local and then the local to the uh, global and i would like to ask her questions about the universals whether there are universals we can subscribe to whether we can keep things as they are and we make sure that they are well very well perceived and understood uh, by the target audience uh, i also would like to ask her questions related to hybridity uh, and living or translating in a hybrid society or a multilingual and multicultural context and community uh, and the also emergence of a third space, not the space of the source language uh, context or community, uh, and not the space of the target language uh, community, but a third space. And I would like to ask her whether the translator or the interpreter as a mediator between both uh, uh, spaces, both uh, uh, contexts, uh, does really live in, in, in that uh, third space. Uh, Professor Mshela will be uh, giving us a, a state of the art in uh, these issues. So without further ado, I hand it over to Professor Mshela. You have the floor, Professor. Your mic, Dr. Mshela. Michelle, I think you are muted. I yes. will try. She is muted. Yeah, I will try. Still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, right. Very well. Perfect, perfect. Okay, perfect. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, so, we can. Here I go. I would like, in fact, to thank you, uh, Hamouda, for uh, everything that you have mentioned and that we discussed earlier on, in fact. And uh, uh, it is indeed some kind of an overview, a swift overview of uh, the various problematics in translation. Uh, and uh, also the continuities and the discontinuities that have been operated in this field, uh, academically speaking, but also this will have some implications on the practice itself. So much of what will follow applies to both translation and interpretation. Of course, my, some people might think that the factor of time is more pertinent in written translation, Whereas space, of course, or the space dimension interp is much more important in interpretation, even though language is one and language is necessarily palimpsestic. That, is, that means that each word is a synchronic but also diachronic stratification of a concentrate of meaning in time and space. Now, in uh, this uh, perspective also, and in addition to this notion of uh, horizontal equivalences or of horizontal equivalences between languages is no longer valid. Uh, translators have always sought equivalences, but in fact, equivalences are no longer valid as uh, given to, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, apprehend uh, the issue of translating. Why is it so? Because of uh, inequalities. And inequalities cannot integrate equivalences. Uh, inequalities mean unequivalences uh, uh, by definition. And these inequalities and unequivalences are a reality to be addressed in apprehending the problematic of translation. Of course, we know of the um, theories of foreignization versus domestication, 
which are incidental to a better understanding of this process. But you will see that this foreignization versus domestication is not that innocent as a perspective and as a tool, and it has many serious implications, especially in uh, our times. So here focus will be on, on theory, even if theory does not seem to, to take much importance and is often swept away as something high flown and often irrelevant to the practice. But I think that theory is essential as much as interdisciplinarity is also for a better grasp of translation, uh, for the uh, better grasp of the translation theories, but also for a more performant and performative uh, uh, translation uh, practice. So the problematic intercultural communication across languages in time and space, enunciated in my title, is that translation is not language-based, but rather culture-based. And that in the here and now global hybridized context, the translator has moved from cultural binarisms, for example, one culture from the cultural binarisms, uh, which has been preceded by the linguisticality of the uh, translation practice. So the translator is moving so from this, uh, the binarisms of culture to uh, new, uh, in this new global hybridized context, he is moving to become more central and uh, more determining, uh, especially starting from the 90s, as I will express, explain later on. Uh, and he operates now in some kind of a third space at the crossroads of cultures. So you see, he no longer had to deal with the language. And then there on with the cultural turn, as we may term it, coming from Massenet and uh, uh, Lucien Lefebvre, essentially. Uh, so from from the, the linguistic to the cultural, and now I think it, uh, the, the emphasis is led more on uh, the, tra the translator. So why is it that binarisms have been displaced? Because today, within one single culture, we have the intracultural, but we have the intercultural. In Tunisia, for example, we're not operating in a pure culture, okay, where people understand each other very well. It's no longer the, the case. There's a lot of uh, multiplicity of stances and a lot of hybridity amongst us all. And uh, so now, uh, if you like, the cultural versus the intercultural is slippery because the center now it can be found in the periphery as well as the periphery and the center. See all the number of immigrants that you find in the metropole. See also the multinational economy that is present everywhere. So these binaries of my culture, your culture, can no longer be valid in a global hybridized uh, context. So, as I said, the turn from the linguistic paradigm to the cultural paradigm has been initiated mainly by Susan Bassnett in the Anglophone Academia and by Henri Lefebvre, Lefebvre in the Francophone world, among other critics, but these were the proponents. I may cite their work, Translation History Culture and the Cultural Turn in Translation Studies, published uh, the Cultural Turn in Translation Studies, written by both Susan Bassant and André Lefebvre. Uh, so, André Lefebvre's word for word, or sense for sense, posits the classical issue of faithfulness. But again, and we have always asked this incessantly, this question, what of faithfulness in translation? Because we know that traditory, traditory, to translate is to betray. I suppose many of you, uh, students of translation, know this idiom, traditori, traditori. So translation, as I said, is not a mere linguistic exercise. 
uh, that was perhaps in the pre 90s until perhaps early 90s it was considered as a linguistic exercise and uh, with the, the introduction of sociological anthropological cultural and ideological discursive aspects uh, now translation seems to be in fact to integrate all these aspects so the sociological anthropological cultural ideological discursive aspects are at work in the act of translating, even if you don't seem to be aware of it while translating. Uh, Venuti, uh, who uh, wrote the translator's invisibility, posits fluency or posited fluency as the essential and prevailing strategy. And for him, the main areas involved in transla translation are diction techniques and strategies. But the things, things are much more complicated than this, because even if the translator is conversant with diction, has some grasp of techniques and rhetorical strategies, still his skill or his task is to take up language data, extract meaning from it, from uh, source language culture A, and transpose it slash superimpose it because sometimes you think that you're, you're transposing meaning but you are superimposing meaning onto or into language and culture b it is true that he or she always has to make a choice for the philosopher paul ricoeur translation who he sees translation as a process of mutual exchange whereby one gains a deeper understanding of oneself through engagement with the other. And he defines this process beautifully as linguistic hospitality. In this way, the translator inhabits the language or is host in both languages and cultures A and B. The risk, however, is that the translator or the host becomes hostile. Here we come to an undesirable triangulation in the process. The interpreter is forcibly an intruder and therefore should most gracefully limit intrusiveness to a minimum while translating. Ideally, the translator interpreter should be a non-person here I'm lifting from Benuti, an absented, invisible person to gain success. And I suppose you have often heard people saying, oh, I was reading this translation and I almost forgot that it was a translation. So the more forgotten by locutors, readers, uh, the more competent and successful a translator is. Furthermore, the language culture binary approaches to translation have moved towards a sociological orientation in both translation and interpreting studies with a focus on, and here this is very important, the agency of translators and interpreters and the social, economic, political context in which translation and interpretation or interpreting takes place. Here I'm paraphrasing a critic, Angel Lely. Uh, 2014. So this is quite recent, and this problematic is quite, you know, has ar arisen quite recently. Uh, and the question is about the agency of the translator: Is the translator a vehicle of conservative ideas or of progressive ideas? Does the translator contribute contribute to advancing uh, and helping the world progress, or on the contrary, does a translator? Uh, in fact, draw uh, back uh, progress. This may be debated later on. And to put it simply, is the translator interpreter a mediator? Is he or she a clarifier? Or is he or she an informant? Remember uh, in Iraq uh, during the war, the first target uh, of assassinations were interpreters. Do you remember that? Okay, so that of course leads us to think about the issue and about the agency and the centrality of translators. But of course, this is an extreme case. 
MD translators mediate between cultures, including ideologies, moral systems, and sociopolitical structures, and attempt to overcome incompatibilities and gaps which stand in the way of the transfer of meaning. Now, more recently, there has been a move towards more focus, as I said, on the translator interpreter rather than on the culture. Works in translation studies by scholars such as Caton in 2013 and Hayton and Mason in the late 90s, among others, has moved the idea of the translator as a mediator to, for, uh, as a mediator to an intercultural communicator. So the translator now is an intercultural communicator. His or her task is to facilitate the process of intercultural communication. Translation thus is an intercultural communicative competence intended to build bridges across languages slash cultures and therefore is a cross-cultural communicative practice. In general, we think that the translator interpreter operates with a text uh, with or on or via a linguistic grammar or the linguistic grammar of a text, where in fact the translator deals with the cultural grammar of a text. Decoding data, for example from language A, and encoding it in language B. In other words, transferring a semiosis, I suppose you're, some of you are uh, familiar with the word of semiosis, so transferring it transferring a semiosis across languages. A semiosis can be defined uh, very quickly and in simple terms as a, the system of signs or the system of meaning, structure of meaning. In this cross-cultural context, the translator-interpreter is more than a mediator of sense, as he or she becomes a clarifier or even a converter of messages. These messages may be verbal and nonverbal. We will talk about kinetic, about attitudes, etc. Tone of voice, intonation, all of this is very important. So, because often translation may become problematic because of an ignorance of the cross cultural aspects and the intercultural communicative patterns. Think, for example, of the intercultural communicative patterns of the Japanese of the Arabs, of their attitudes, their stance, their kinetics, etc. So all of this is very important to understand. One major issue remains as to how to find a balance between accuracy and the cultural given, which is ever present. This is further complicated by the, the fact that translators operate in a solitary, monovalent process. They work with other people's texts and are at the same time laden with their own textualities. We may call this, in, uh, if you like, uh, erudite terms, episteme, identity, culture, values, attitudes, etc. So when you're translating, you're translating somebody else's text, but at the same time you have your own textuality. Okay, your own episteme. And that which is quite stressful is that you have no immediate feedback, positive or negative. Uh, that, of course, adds to the anxiety and the stress uh, induced by the profession. Now, let me move to more recent times uh, with its uh, sing singular problematics. With the globalization, glo globalization phenomena, I don't know whether you are uh, aware or familiar with the notion of globalization, uh, localization, sorry. It means the localization of the globe. The, lo lo the glo uh, globalization, uh, uh, let me take an example of very, very trivial example of globalization. Uh, this is um, the genes, for example. Genes have been globalized. Sustainable development has been localized. So these are global, if you like, concepts that have been localized. So we need to be aware in this cross-cultural context of the globalization, localization phenomena. 
And of course, this adds to uh, the role of the interpreter. Um, as I said again earlier on, it's a cross-cultural vehicle. Uh, at the same time, in this process of globalization, globalization, we see that cultures are in a process or are in a cross process of hybridization. And today, cultural essentialism is no longer the stance. Cultural essentialism means, I mean, in very simple terms, again, uh, the purity of a culture. You can't speak in terms of pure, my culture is pure. Your culture is hybrid. Your culture is contaminated, whether you like it or not. For the, the, the scholars who are conducting research, for example, and who want to uh, read more about this, they can refer to Homi Baba on hybridization, the hybridization of cultures. In addition to globalization, we have technological advances. And technological advances have added more to the, flu the fluid notion of a text. What is a text today and in the global and in the global? And of course, the fluidity and the slippery aspect of text have brought more focus and responsibility on the translator. Now texts and concepts are more mobile and less fixed than before. An example of this fluidity may be seen, for example, in the way uh, information is translated and broadcast on, on various uh, media by journalists. Texts that are fluid and not fixed, they are adapted, they are converse, converted to various cultural contexts and to different audiences. Yet, more importantly, this global awareness of the cross-cultural dimension is central to the profession especially that most our work or exchanges are done in the sphere of international development. We may refer to the diplomatic aspects, health, trade, or NGOs. NGOs are very important here. So we need here to consider the hierarchy amongst languages and cultures and locutors while translating. I suppose those who have evolved in an uh, in um, uh, international organization uh, have a grasp of what I mean here. Okay? So we must consider this hierarchy amongst languages, cultures, locutors, and naturally peoples and nations. At the same time, geographies and histories are key to conceptualizing cross-cultural approaches to translation and to defining the interpreter's cross-cultural stance and practice. The cross-cultural is not a space or, or a geography only. It also covers other dimensions, such as gender, age, race, class, etc., with their different registers, codes, values, notions of political correctness, covered and covered, because sometimes you don't seem to be, uh, they're not implicit, they're covered, you know, but you have to detect them and to transpose them and to grasp them and to translate them, if you like, because translation is no longer, especially in the anthropological sense, to translate means to transform something into something meaningful. So, this means that the translator is faced with a text, but also with a paratext. As well, what is a paratext? This is lifted from Girard Genet. If you want to hear, read more about uh, this notion of paratext. And paratext, simply defined, is a set of discursive practices. But also, the translator is faced not only with the paratext, but also with the temporality to the text. Hence the importance of historicizing concepts and happenings. As an example of the historicization or the temporality of a concept, I may invoke the term freedom. I remember that when I was young, I hated the word freedom 
because my mother used to tell me to be free, which means know your limits. And I just stated it, okay? Now freedom means the absence of limits, you see? In my mind at that time, uh, enslavement meant uh, limits. On the other hand, I think that we need also to look at English as a global language or as a lingua franca. And this global language or lingua franca leaves the illusion of a normalized, quasi-prescriptive, globalized doxa. Doxa means common sense or agreed upon knowledge, whose effect is more marginalizing as it leaves little room for alternative discourses and local paroles. Most of our work is inscribed in these hierarchies anyway. So top-down projects from powerful donors and global organizations where we have a mix of local projects with need to communicate across many languages. Think of NGOs, for example, diversity, multilingual contexts and contact zones, and uses us to reflect more on the role of the translator. And here I quote, from Angelelli, so induces us to reflect more on the role of the translator, quote, with, with a focus on the agency of translators and interpreters and the social context in which translation and interpreting takes place. Angelelli, 2014. For those interested in the bibliography, I can always post some uh, useful titles. Now, of course, this leads me to uh, the basic ethics of the translator-interpreter, represented traditionally in faithfulness, accuracy, and completeness of neither omitting nor adding. Uh, of course, these ethics, or the fact of omitting and adding, the fact of being you know, accurate, etc., are quite slippery. Why is it so? Because of the fluidity of meaning and of circumstance, as I explained, especially in a crisscross cultural context. Think of, for example, meetings when you have all sorts of nationalities from the West and from the rest, and think of the slippery aspect of meaning. How are you going to fix that meaning, which is quite fluid, especially in that context, when, for example, sustainability, which is the, one of the trendiest, of course, words, uh, does sustainability mean the same thing as somebody, an, um, an agent from the United Nations, uh, dealing with the goals, uh, the sustainable goals of development, and for an African, not at all. So there's this fluidity of meaning, and there's more stress, if you like, and responsibility on the translator to bridge these gaps. So, uh, as a consequence, these classical ethics are thus, or need to be modulated in favor of new forms of ethics as articulated by House in, in 2017, in uh, her translation, The Basics. We, and who, referring to Emmanuel Levinas's, I don't know if you know Emmanuel Levinas, he's a wonderful, wonderful translator of the world of the you. Okay? So, referring to Levinas uh, in translation, the basics, House writes that translators now need to gain a heightened transcultural consciousness, causing them to reflect on their transnational actions and on the complicated ethical relationship between author, text, and the translator. That was in 2017. So this notion that the translator should aspire to a heightened transcultural consciousness acknowledges the responsibility of the translator in the workplace who may need to develop a stronger awareness of ethical considerations. For example, when translating on behalf of individuals who have experienced injustices or exploitation. In words which echo Venuti's fierce denigration of an ethnocentric approach to translation, House, the same critic, 
further argues that the translator with a heightened transcultural awareness should, quote, actively resist the perpetuation of ethnocentric values and the seamless integration of the foreign into one's own cultural system. This, in fact, refers to foreignization, of course. The translator has to make decisions based on ethical considerations, which need to be prioritized above the linguistic and cultural elements in the text. In this sense, translation becomes a form of social practice which has implications in the workplace, but also in the real world. In conclusion, beyond the linguistic and cultural features of translation, excuse me, we must consider the social and political responsibility of those involved in the translation process and the need to acknowledge the importance of ethical behavior in translation. As a post-conclusion, very short, I shall address untranslated abilities. Here, I'm not talking about idioms, proverbs, metaphors of poetry, how, which are often untranslatable. I am referring to moments when words seem unable to translate experience in some difficult circumstances. Many of us have encountered this problem. In the Babel of translators and translation, there are spaces of untranslatability. When the translator is caught between big things and small things, especially. Some of you may have the memory of simple inarticulate subaltern speaking in the most untranslatable, non-communicative way. And you as a translator striving to get it through because of your sense of ethical responsibility towards the untranslatable experience of the small other or inarticulate other. So even in, in a horizontal context, even in a horizontal equal context, meaning is always sliding and indeterminate. So, and this is complicated, even more complicated by the inarticulate and the hierarchical. The question, can the subaltern speak, sounded by the Bengali critic and translator Spivak, she translated Derrida, has been inspired her by a peasant who came to a meet, United Nations meeting to present his plea and complaint, leaving all baffled in total un-understanding. This, of course, brings us back to essentials in the production of sense. That is how to articulate the other's inarticulateness and to make unheard, unheeded small voices heard. And I think I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I shall be glad and delighted to uh, ask any queries and to listen to any useful comments you may you may you may do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bshela, for taking us in this journey in time and space. Thank you. In time and space. But before I give the floor to the guests to ask questions and raise comments, I have a question myself. Yes. Uh, you said that the uh, translator is the host uh, and the host is always having much freedom when home and I would like to relate this to the question and the debate on hospitality and hostility you have mm -hmm. made reference to that and more uh, more importantly to the question of visibility invisibility uh, of the translator so how can you be the host and still invisible? This is the first question. Second, mm -hmm. you said, and, and the second question is, if you are the host, how can you be invisible and you uh, apply or you make the approach of the more forgotten the more competent the translator is. Can you uh, please repeat the second question? Because I yes. was 
Yeah, yeah. So here, if you are the host, mm -hmm. so you have to be visible. Okay. Not uh, to be forgotten and left behind. Uh, and there is always a very uh, uh, well-cited uh, saying that, and you, you, you made reference to that, that we are better when we are forgotten as translators and interpreters. So as if there were uh, a contact between two discourses, two texts, without any mediator. And it's the question of mediation here. Mm -hmm. So, But again, translation is interpretation. Mm -hmm. Translation is interpretation. Mm -hmm. When you interpret the new meaning that you are producing, which is supposedly faithful to the original meaning, will be mm -hmm. colored by your background, cultural background, yes. psychological situation. Now, this is the your process of triangulation, in fact. Triangulation, exactly. And, and, and you said it. You said that accuracy is tricky and is slippery. Yes. You, you, you mentioned that. So uh, my question is, again, if you are translating, you are taking decisions. You are taking decisions. How can you make your decisions without understanding? And you cannot understand without having your own way of doing it, basing it on your uh, culture, your psychology, and so mm -hmm. on. And I have another question very briefly on the uh, question of globalization. Mm -hmm. Globalization. Uh, don't you think that this is driven by uh, commercial purposes just to make the universal local to, uh, uh, to make people at the local community buy products that are designed to be universal but uh, they are in fact not universal they are serving one community one uh, uh, local uh, setting uh, yes i will stop at this yeah okay thank you very much shall i uh, respond right now to your question if if you like what is the format that you like we take two or three questions or you spend after each question I think it's better to perhaps group questions. Let me first of all address your questions. Yes, thank and you. then uh, perhaps you can take uh, about four two, questions. Three, two, three, four. Okay. Three the way you want. So uh, it is true that you know the, this notion of the translator inhabiting a language and then traveling from language A to to language B, and again being a host in the language. At the same time. Um, in fact, when you're a host, uh, you discover also many new things about yourself. When you go to a foreign country or a foreign language, you're faced with your, with, with your own otherness, with your own strangeness. Okay? Uh, so, when I like this notion of being host, because when you're a host also, you somehow are other-oriented. You don't, you're not thinking about yourself. You're thinking about the people who open their houses to you. Okay, and so you need to know your limits, not to become hostile or an intruder, as I said earlier on. Okay, you have to be careful not to be an intruder, an intruder in the meaning. So there's a lot of delicateness, in fact, here on the part of the translator. That means that he enters your house of language at the same time <coughs> language is a prison but at the same time offers infinite and limitless possibilities of playing with the language isn't that true so you really have to find the golden means and the best translators are those who find the, the golden means they inhabit the language they are good hosts and they do not become intruders, and they do not become hostile to the language. They do not pervert it, they do not add, they do not uh, omit. They, they try to find some kind of balance because they are quite present in that house of language themselves. And they're faced with their otherness, as I am saying. They're faced with the strangeness 
of the other, but also with the strangeness of themselves. So, yes, here, in fact, when we deal with this encounter between languages, there is necessarily some kind of a triangulation. I think that the previous uh, theories were so simple when uh, they were, in fact, envisaging some kind of a translation that goes word by word. And this is how we were taught translation as a pedagogical exercise, to find equivalences, okay? Now, this leads me to uh, when you were talking about equivalences, okay? You want to transpose. Equivalences are so slippery today, okay? If I say, for example, freedom, in the same political context in Tunisia, freedom means all sorts of things. Democracy also means all sorts of things. Uh, woman, what is a woman? Who is a woman? What is a man today? You see what I mean? Okay. So we have to be very uh, fully aware of uh, the flippancy, the sliding aspects of meaning when we are good interpreters. Yeah. And to find, I don't know, ways out. Yes, you need to decide because essentially because uh, of the uh, intricate aspect of equivalences. See what I mean? Uh, then your question about globalization, of course, globalization is essentially uh, driven by the free market, by economy, okay? But you know that uh, economy also has an impact on our own personal economies, that means mental economies. This is why we often hear about mental colonization, imperialism, imperial colonization, mental imperialism, that means that you ingurgitate, etc. And that is also the reason why what we call foreignization, you know the meaning of foreignization and translation? Maybe the students don't they, know. They do, they do. Foreignization and domestication, Excellent. they know. Okay. Yeah. That's why right. this is why foreignization seems to be some kind of an imposition on your own language. Okay, uh, I don't know if you say the word God in a sub Saharan African context, it does not mean Allah, it may mean any inanimate object. Okay, a flower even could mean a, a God. So, uh, for example, if you say by God, they will start staring at you. Which God? Yes. They have so many gods, you see. Or in the name of God. <laughs> the same in, in, in Bali. When I went to Bali, I loved the fact that they were having a God, a new God every day. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this discourages gods or politicians by extrapolation from exercising any long term tyranny on us, you see. Uh, and this is also uh, found in uh, Alisa uh, by Fawzi Malih, the novel. Yeah. They uh, build gods or they draw gods and they, they sweep away the, the next day. Uh, Excellent. But Alisa was written uh, <laughs> under Bourguiba and everybody was really fed up with the unending reign of uh, Al Mujahid al Atta. Yeah. I hope I answered you, the question. You answered very well the question. Thank you very much. And it is also good that you cited Julian House in your presentation. And this is an announcement that uh, we will be having her as a guest speaker on June 7th uh, at 11 uh, a.m. Tunis time. Uh, so let's take uh, the participants. Now we have uh, Ula. Tahir, Nada, Benaoun, Dr. Layla Lakhwa, Liza Saidi. Yes, let's start with Ula, please. Yes, uh, um, thank you, Doctor, for this uh, thoughtful talking. Uh, um, my question is somehow irrelevant to the, the idea of translation and interpreting. Uh, it is uh, about the, the, the idea that you have mentioned regarding the text, uh, the author, and the reader. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask about a theory, it's called intertextuality, 
Um, I yeah. have searched a lot to find an answer for that question. I hope and I'm, I'm, I'm truly uh, sure that you have the answer. So I'm going to take the opportunity. Yes. <laughs> yes, I would like to ask, um, does a text uh, related or intertextuality itself related to the environment or the surroundings or the date in which the text is written? Well, um, I was, um, uh, you know, having a kind of um, two texts uh, who have been a kind of link between uh, each other, like, let us say, kind of methods like Oedipus Rex or uh, Electra, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yes. some, uh, some dramatists or uh, authors have tackled uh, these uh, myths in their own writings. Mm -hmm. Studying these, these two uh, literary works from the theory of intertextuality, does it require to resort to the environmental or the, uh, the date in which the texts were, were written? And thank you, thank you uh, in advance. Thank you, Ola. I think you are from an Egyptian university. Ola. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm from Egypt. Welcome. Yeah. Now, uh, can I ask uh, to answer uh, one question after another, you see, yeah. in order to see whether, you know, I have provided a uh, satisfaction with the person. Yes, yes, go ahead, please, yes. Okay, so, Ule, yes, you have brought the issue of intertextuality, and the question is whether you have to refer to the specific time and place of their production. Right? Yes, and the ther and the the idea of uh, um, the surroundings of the whole uh, literary yes. work, like yes, the historical absolutely. backgrounds, you know. Yes, absolutely, I understand that. You know, yes, it, does the uh, theory of intertextuality requires to resort to the historical background or just to deal with the text itself, whether to deal with the original text and the mimic text or just to resort to the historical backgrounds? I, I really need the answer to that question. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I have, uh, you know, mentioned uh, palimpsest at the beginning of my presentation, and I advise you to read Gérard Genet on narratology. He talks about palimpsest, something palimpsestic. I think that you need to be conversant with the culture of literature. You see why, why culture is so varied and multifarious. So if you want to grapple with a text, you have to be aware of uh, the whole heritage behind that text. There might be a uh, that that might uh, have to do with mythology, could be biblical mythology, Greco-Roman mythology, and every text comes in to pile or to be built upon another text. So we'll see that texts are stratified in some kind of a palimpsestic way. The best example of this is James Joyce. James, in order to understand James Joyce, you have to be an erudite in literature. That is also part of comparative literature. Okay, and Henri, Henri Lefebvre, in fact, comes also from the sphere of uh, comparative literature. And for him, everything has become comparative literature. So the more you read about literature, the more erudition and insight you gain, and the more, the more you dig and the more you discover wealth. You see what I mean? Yes, yes. So even in your, your analysis can be, if you like, upgraded. It be, may be multi-layered. The beginning is superficial. Then the more you do and the more di you discover things. And you will find that in the temporality of the text. That means in the, uh, some kind of uh, verticality, if you like, verticality within the text. Palimpsestic verticality. But also, there are other intertextualities or exchanges. You spoke about Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift was always, always commercing and talking in the most hilarious and derisive way with Pope, uh, the poet, his contemporary. Okay? Did I answer your question? Yes, fully. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Some of it, I mean, partly of it. You could, can never have more than it. enough. More than enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Next question. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Ola. Nadeb uh, Benaun. Thank you very much for the insightful lecture. I was actually going to. Uh,
ask you to dwell on the notion of palimpsest and the palimpsestic effect, uh, what uh, you just did, so thank you. Ah, okay. So, yeah, okay, a question answered. Now, Dr. Lechwa, please. Can you hear me? We Perfect. can. Yes. Perfectly well. Hi, Good to see you. Okay, uh, you mentioned the, the term semiosis earlier. I just want to make, uh, if you could make a difference, if there is any, between semiotics and semiosis. Is semiosis a branch of semiotics? That's my question. Yes, ah, your question. Well, semiotics is a discipline. Okay, semiotics yeah. is the discipline of the study of science. Yeah. Okay, but a semiosis is some kind of a system, a construct, if you like. I'm trying to simplify here, okay, I'm being pedagogical. Semiotics is like linguistics, for example. Okay. okay. It's the study of science in general, okay. Yeah. But semiosis is a whole complete system of signs and of meanings okay you construct a semiosis around something for instance <coughs> you may take um, flowers yeah you may construct a positive semiosis around flowers but you can also construct a negative and lethal semiosis about flowers okay See what I mean? i'm trying to simplify again this is my reflex of a teacher, to simplify things. So oh. I don't want people to rebuke me for not being <laughs> deep enough, or, but this is very, very useful. These things are very useful, you see? True. It's like when I was trying to explain uh, deconstruction and I explained it in very, very simple terms and the students said, wow, madame, <laughs> you made our day because you can simplify things. You sure. might simplify things. I mean, the more you know, the simpler you can be. This is, you know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not pretending that I know everything, but I have enough experience with, you know, teaching as students. So semiosis is a system that you build a construct. Semiotics is a discipline. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Saidi, please. Yes. Hello. Um, Hello. So. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mshala, for this uh, insightful lecture. Um, my question is about the invisibility of the translator in literary uh, translation. So, can the translator still remain invisible when facing um, cultural distinction in literary translation? Yes. And how to avoid the disloyalty vis a vis the source text? Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. Can I add something here regarding this question? Uh, it is the same question yesterday. It is the same question, yeah. Uh, yes. Because some of the uh, masterpieces they are known in translation more than in their original texts. So here there is a very uh, a, a creative force in literary translation, a creative force that created a new text. So, yes. uh, so production of a new text that is parallel to the original text. Mm -hmm. So here, the, the same question again, uh, whether about invisibility and visibility, it, it is, uh, the, the, the translator is visible, yes. whether we like it or not. Mm, I think that there is a bad visibility and a good visibility. Let me g take the example of Ahlim Musta'anmi's The Kiratul Jasad. It's been translated uh, at the uh, American University in Cairo because I intended to translate it and I was grappling with it and, you know, the sentences were turning in my head, etc. And it's all because I had to teach it in my Maghrebian studies course. It was a terrible translation. And there was one point when uh, the author, well, the, the narrator, in fact, uh, her name is Ahlim, don't do sometimes she's Halim, sometimes she's Hayat. And she was invoking gods. Uh, she was, in fact, uh, espousing, or she was speaking on behalf of her be bereaved be uh, lover. And she was invoking gods and uh, the saints, yes, Sidi Abd al Qadr, blah, blah, blah. And you know what the translator did? She removed the whole passage, she didn't translate it. 
She didn't understand it, okay? So here we can see that there is a lot of bad visibility and that she's a very bad host, host in, uh, in, uh, in that text. Uh, but I think that, that I, in fact, I asked that question yesterday to Mohammed. I think it all depends on the genius and on the knowledgeable aspect and on the erudition and the passion and, you know, the love of that text and the determination of the translator. For instance, if you're translating a text, or an 18th century text, you're not going to translate it in 20th century language. At the same time, you don't want to, you want it to be, um, uh, if it, uh, well received at the same time, because you're translating for a contemporary audience. But you don't want it to be insipid. You want to insufflate the spirit, the tempo, the emotions, the idiosyncrasy, you know, the whole, the universe, the literary universe. You want to transpose it in your translation. Agree with me? So there's a lot of research to be done. It's a very patient process. Uh, and if you do it very well, you will become a very good host. That, that means uh, not in, totally invisible, but homely and nice to have in that language. You see what I mean? So you're not exercising any violence on that language. And at the same time, you're taking that language and bringing it closer in time to us. Did you get my meaning? Um, yes. Uh, actually, I uh, you brought up another question in my yeah. mind. So um, you go, ahead, you gave yes. the example of Ahlam yes. <laughs> Um and there is uh, one of I don't really remember which um, which novel of her. Um, she mentioned Al Kisra, Al Kisra, which yes. is um, bread. I uh, <laughs> yes, it's a kind of bread. I don't know how you call it in uh, Tunisia. Um, and the translator um, translated it Hobbes as like Alex. Sometimes, yes. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes. Um, and there is um, even one of um, say that a poem, Shabi um, poem, where um, where the writer um, mentioned the uh -huh. Okay. And yeah. uh, it it was translated it was translated into um, as if it uh, it was uh, a sound no. and not what is it actually. So, yeah. do you think that the translator should be native um, native of the source language in uh, this context? I think proximity is very important. Yeah. Okay. Proximity is very important, especially if you are translating not a factual text, but a metaphorical text. And also you will discover better or uh, unveil better the palimpsestic aspect, the covert also culture, because there's always an overt, but also a covert culture. When you say al miqyas remember the figure of al miqyas in Ahle Musrani, okay? And you wanted to call her Atiqa. He wanted to, her to be like her mother and to wear the, the heavy maquillas of her mother. And that was only a metaphor for the tradition. And you have to vehicle all that. Okay? It's not just a piece of jewelry. So, yes, you need really to be... Um, this is why, you know, translation, literary translation is really difficult. And you have to, if you're not conversant, much conversant with the literature, what you can do is read more about literature, read more books. Let me give you the example of a text that I translated. It's a tra travel, travel, it is travel literature of somebody who came with the name of Sir Granville Temple who came to Tunisia in 1832. And he transcribed the name of places in Arabic in the text. You can find also the same thing in Ahle Musalmi's uh, text. What are you going to do with these Arabic words? And I remember that he made some mistakes. For example, Makthar is called Mahdhar. 
And I kept it as it is. I thought maybe in the past people used to call it mahdhar or mahdhar. And then it evolved into makthar. How do I know? Do I have the right to change it in Arabic, in the text? No. So you see, it was a decision on my part, okay? But it was an informed and a cautious decision. It's not something that I threw in like that. It really kept turning in my mind. And also, I remember that I had to transcribe, to translate legends of paintings about my country, about Tunisia. And the legends were wonderful. It took me days and days. And can, you, can you please give us one example of one legend and how you uh, translated them to uh, non tunisian audience? I have the book in French, but I have to, uh, if you want, I can send you... Please. Uh, I can send you the whole text of my translation, which Please. was quite appreciated and published in the English version of uh, this book of painting on Tunisia and about Tunisia. Please. And yeah. there were passages about the Mu'adhan and the, the, this Italian painter was so much in love. Let me bring the book. Uh, oh, here. Tunisia, okay. Yes, his name is Fluvio Reuter. Okay, this is the book. Okay. Uh, I used it uh, to heighten a little bit my computer. <laughs> so it was <laughs> under my computer. <laughs> and uh, it's, these are wonderful, wonderful paintings. And, uh, uh, and the preface is so very well wrought that I wanted to translate it also uh, the same beautiful you know, way. Yeah. Uh, Vision, listen for example to this Mais ses visions et ses rêveries ne sont pas encore le bonheur me disais-je tandis que je continuais mon chemin vers le sud découvrant par hasard un lieu destiné à m'emprisonner pour toujours par son charme le cimetière marin de Mahdia les tombes miniatures nues de tout ornement descendant et presque retenues vers la ligne de la mer avec les petites stèles tournées vers la Mecque dans l'attente d'une réunion absolue. Very nice. I read that text. Very nice text. text. And, yeah. I had, and it took me, and I told, um, it was serious, and I told them, give me my time, the time necessary to translate the text, this preface, and also the legends. The legends were short, but so difficult. For example, here, the legends, le métro de Tunis, no, that's nothing, that's not. Le sourd de Cheshia and uh, about bread, these were photographs in Koba. Un tombeau de marabout, comme il en surgit à chaque pas au pays de l'islam, dressé au milieu de retraits et de cours, d'impasse, une coupole et des cubes de chaux si délicieusement tachés de vénure et de moisi, etc. So you see, Very nice. I really needed time. So you need a lot of passion. But if you're translating factual aspects, even there, for instance, if you're translating a medical text, you need to be uh, familiar with medical culture or medical rhetorical strategies. You see what I mean? And even if you're aware of that, it depends who you are translating for. You know, I think that I'm a good translator, but sometimes there are translations which come back to me. And they say, no, it's too, I, we want it to be brushed up, okay? Mm. For example, no complicated structures for short sentences. It depends, really. Uh, and also when uh, Lisa was asking also about invisibility, I think also even there when you are uh, translating, you have also to have... Uh, a more or less clear notion about who, are, who you are translating for. The same for interpreting. I often ask the question, especially in, uh, for the international organizations I work for, the audience, what kind of audience? For example, if it's uh, people working in the municipality, you're not going to uh, use your best French. You're going to use plain French. Otherwise, nobody is going to follow. But if you were translating for big shops in, in, in diplomatic services, here, of course, I, 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 I show my arsenal, okay? And uh, I display my... Uh, Action muscles. <laughs> <to> <laughs> muscles. 
<laughs> too impressed. Right. <laughs> and very often, so, it is, yeah, so, people are impressed. They say, what did you learn your English? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, Press, I'm worried about time. Uh, okay. We have almost uh, six minutes left, but we have three requests. Uh, we have uh, Mohammed Al Mansouri. You have the floor, please. Sure. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Nice to see hello. you again, hello. Professor Mshala. Thank you, Dr. Hi. Salhi. Thank hello. you, Professor. Yeah. Greetings from here. I'm glad you raised uh, oh, all your just invoked uh, mm -hmm. I yeah. happen to have a, a student who is evaluating uh, the, the translation of the uh, Akira yes. I, I, I believe the title is The Bridges of Constantine as it was translated Now the Akira Jasad is body uh, uh, memory I, no no uh, I forgot the Kiritul just said. Uh, anyway, we have this this no, this no, version, no. yeah. And in this version, yeah, in this version, you have one bit at least, in which the uh, the author refers to a raqs bil maharam. Yeah, raqs bil maharam. She meant you know something like scarves, but the translator made of it something incestuous. <laughs> it's <laughs> as it, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Uh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> one student... So yeah. One student... Following oh, Zina al-Maharam. <laughs> yeah. One... Uh, one uh, oh, Rashayan uh, al-Maharam, in fact, in Sesta. Mm -hmm. I, I, I found somewhere. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the... One student referred to Kisra. You know, that type of clay oven baked bread. You can... Yes. You may call it clay oven baked bread or bread, yeah. home bread not Something even like that Mohammed. i know yeah. what kisra is in algerian mm -hmm. it's some kind of bread that you cook in a clay tagine that's it yeah. so it's not a clay in that thing. Thing. not a in clay that tray thing. yeah call it clay tray for instance yeah. something like this yeah or pan like that yeah exactly. some people also tend to um um exaggerate the use of transliteration there are parts where you transliterate like jihad for instance you may transliterate jihad but that's not enough and you can't transliterate kisra i mean this is criminal really in 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 in, in translation so this this is one uh, one one of my comments the other one relates to uh, you use the word commerce it's really a very interesting word it speaks to me a lot in the wasteland, for instance, you have a commerce with tradition, with legends, with Shakespeare, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hamlet, uh, folklore, you know, written, Ovid, folklore, all, all, yeah, all sorts of, all sorts of things. Yeah. So my suggestion is, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, could we, since you mentioned intrusion, hybridization, contamination, temporality of concepts, paratexts and agency of the translator and ethics, would it be good to have on the curriculum a, a, a subject entitled uh, translation evaluation? That is, you take two translations of the wasteland, for instance, and then you derive from the translation Mm -hmm. through collaborative work those concepts that you that you mentioned so there are two ways of approaching it either you introduce your students to all these dimensions that you mentioned mm -hmm. or else derive these dimensions from existing translations yeah and what are your thoughts on this you mean the inductive uh, or deductive method sure. okay that's it inductive method uh, I think that both are uh, perhaps a mixture of uh, theory and uh, also preparing students for cultural theory, for colonial theory, all of that which is in fact uh, changing the face of the world because subalternity is there and very often uh, its voice is unheard, but it still is contributing to much changing. And you see that, uh, for example, in the charters of 
some international organizations, you do see the importance of other people's languages. So I think you can do that. Uh, I mean, introduce the students to some theory and at the same time give them exercises in order for them to implement the theory, provide them with the tools. I think they need tools. Students always need tools. It's like having uh, a hammer and a screwdriver and uh, nails, etc., to come up with something, to construct something. So I think that both can be done in a par parallel way. Uh, about, uh, and also Le Leila, not Leila, Lisa, I think, uh, s spoke about uh, different ways of translating. I think it's exactly the same as uh, multiple, multiple readings. The text can be read uh, in different ways by different people at different times and in different spaces. True. So this also students should be uh, aware, made aware of uh, the flippancy of uh, reading, but also the flippancy of uh, translations. However, I think that we also need to equip them with quality analysis regarding translation tools to understand and apprehend quality analysis and translation. Because you see, for example, today, the, 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 um, the, um, we are invaded by all sorts of translators, not only in Tunisia, but even elsewhere. We hear a lot of complaints about people. Uh, it's a marketing thing also. They'd rather take, you know, unexperienced uh, translators. Okay. Going back to Ahli uh, Mustranmi, uh, I remember now how the title has been translated, Memories of the Flesh. Personally, when I thought about translating Ahli Mustranmi, the Kirat al Jasad, I was thinking of the title Body Memory. Why Body Memory? Because Ahli Mustranmi is not, in fact, writing a specific novel that refers to a self-reflexive specific novel that refers to her own experience. She is a metaphor for the whole of Algeria. Remember when she gets wed to uh, a military, she says half the people sat drinking and the other uh, half sat praying, sat praying. So because Algeria was wed to these gen generals, to the military, half Algerians are sitting in, 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 in bars drinking, and the other half is uh, sitting in mosques uh, praying. So and at the same time, this betrayal, you know, essential or radical betrayal, and by choosing the title body memory, I was thinking of the social body, the political body, the maternal body, the national body. And so you see, it's not only the fact of being aware of the culture, that means the artifacts, the objects that people your universe. You also need to be aware of the agency or the agenda of the writer. She was not reading some kind of an exotic book to talk about Algeria. That was a political stance, that was a political, an essentially political parole. Feminist, yes but also that transcends feminism towards a, a more noble agency, the freedom of her people and the dignity of her people. And that's exactly what I was trying to, um, to express when I spoke about subalternity. When you're translating the subaltern, somebody who is inarticulate, refugees, children, women, uh, whatever, you have to... Uh, be host in their experience and try to help them articulate it or articulate it using their own words but giving them more intensity because of this ethical responsibility. Okay. Thank you. Hamid, well, did I I'm, your questions? Yeah. Pr Professor Mansouria, yeah, you have the floor. If uh, she asked you whether she answered your question. Oh, it's perfectly fine. Th thank you very much, Professor Shen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so, you. Professor Bshela, we time is up. Can and we have two requests. Can we take them at the same time? And you take them uh, on one go. No problem. Thank you, Dad and Yusuf. Dad, please. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Salhe and uh, Professor. 
Um, I, my question is, uh, is uh, very simple. Uh, since we are talking about translation mista mistakes and misunderstandings, uh, and uh, sometimes the translation being better than the original, original book uh, mm -hmm. what do you do you recommend to read first the original book or the translation thank you thank you you sir salhi you sir hello madam uh, i'm sorry i wrote my i think we have lost question you because i have a lot of oh, noise next to me it's okay so uh, i wanted i wanted to know like do you think that displaced writers who write in another language, for example. So there are breaks. Well, maybe she can write the, yeah. the question. Yeah, please, can you, uh, uh, Professor, can you take the first question and I will ask her to write down her question. Yep. Yes, uh, the first question was whether to read the, the translated text, which is better, or the initial text. I think that you need both. Because even a badly written text may have some kind of a message. I'm thinking here of a text, uh, an African uh, text uh, that we read in my doctoral, uh, you know, uh, studies. The Palm Wine Drinkard. It's written in uh, some kind of a, a dialect, you see, and it's written by somebody who. Uh, I'm trying to remember the, the writer. The writer is uh, an illiterate person, okay? He's an illiterate person, and he wrote uh, The Palm Wine Drinker, which is a story based on a folktale. Amos Tutola comes back to me. So Amos Tutola wrote this book, The Palm Wine Drinker, which is based on a folktale, local folktale. He wrote it into ba very bad English. But it was interesting to read it, you see? To see this hybridization, hierarchy of languages, how there is one language that is imposed on the other, how the concepts, local concepts, in fact, uh, burge out. Like in Achibi, for instance, when he says, I have no mouth to tell you about it. Okay, that mean, he means in English that he is unable to, he doesn't have the words to express it. Okay, and he talks about somebody else who is. Uh, uh, trying to be nice and a little bit slimy, and he says, talking sweet, okay, and he says, uh, he promises that he will be doing unheard of things with English, which is wonderful, okay? So the palm white drinker, even though he was illiterate, did something unheard of with English, okay? <laughs> And uh, we read it uh, for uh, the preps for the doctoral in when, I, when I was in, in La Sopa. We read it as uh, one of the texts for uh, the prelims for PhD. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have lost uh, uh, okay. Salhi Yusser and I cannot see any text written. I apologize for her. I'm sorry we cannot uh, take any other question. That was mm -hmm. another encounter encounter uh, on intercultural communication across languages in time and space. Uh, Professor Mshela has taken us in, in that journey to another shore uh, uh, on communication in cross cultural and inter uh, 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 cultural communication. Uh, I'm uh, really very happy that this uh, encounter has been attended by uh, some very uh, good friends and colleagues. Uh, special thanks go to them. And here I would like to mention uh, Dr. Leila Lakhwa, Dr. Aida Haddad, Professor Mohammed Mansouri and Dr. Mohammed Zahoud and others. Uh, I also would like to thank my students for uh, being active in these encounters. The encounters uh, continue uh, today and tomorrow, and here is the program of today and tomorrow. Uh, 
at 5 p.m. we will be having another guest speaker, Hanem Farhati, speaking about Arabic English, Arabic legal translation. Tomorrow we will be having Professor Muhammad al-Mansour, who, who is with us now. He, uh, he will be speaking about translation between unrelated languages, challenges and tips. And at uh, 7 p.m. we will be having Sheikh Hamza Youssef, who will be speaking about from California, who is the founder of uh, Zaytuna College, will be speaking about interpreting Islamic religious discourse to uh, non-Arab uh, speakers. So be with us. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, and I wish you a uh, pleasant uh, afternoon and evening. Thank and bye-bye and take care. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you.